We believe that there is no system more important than education to fighting against racism. And we believe that our work in social and emotional learning must actively contribute to anti-racism. SEL has the potential to do a lot of things. It has the potential to help people move from anger to agency and then to action. Understanding and processing issues of affect, and in today's moment, it's anger. People feel a lot of anger, and rightfully so. And moving that emotion to agency, to speaking truth, to finding and sharing your voice, and ultimately to action, to executing on goals, to having the moral courage to act in the face of challenges, including enormous challenges of racism, irrespective of the color of your skin, these are all really important things that matter. And we see SEL as a tool for anti-racism. We also know that the education system itself needs transformation. It needs to support all children and adults in building on their interests, helping to create positive identities, eliminating biases, strengthening relationships across differences, and co-creating communities where all individuals can thrive. Today, you'll be hearing from my colleagues at CASEL, and these are members of our CASEL leadership team who have been working really hard to learn about the, about the intersection of SEL as a lever for equity and the critical role that it can play in helping us to achieve those goals. CASEL's been working for many years to advance the understanding of both the research and the implementation of SEL in service of equity. We are fundamentally a learning organization and we've prioritized issues of equity in the center of our work for a long time. Rob Jagers, who is our Vice President of Research, and Melissa Schlinger, who is our Vice President of, of Practice, um, will be sharing with you all today some information about the work that we have underway on the research side and on the practice side to help advance this mission. We very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, engage with you, Melissa, in this conversation about the work that we've uh, been doing and really um, offer up some of the content of some of the conversations we've been having over the past couple of years. Thanks, Rob. Um, and I'm looking forward to this as well. This topic has um, been important to the organization and to us and our work for a long time. And I'm looking forward to sharing with the audience about some of that important work. Um, and I thought it would be good to start with um, your work and the research that you've done to advance this information. Um, you wrote a really important paper with Dr. Revis, De Debbie Revis Drake and Teresa Borowski. Some of you may remember Dr. Debbie Revis Drake from last week's webinar. The paper was called Equity in Social and Emotional Learning, a Cultural Analysis. And in that paper, you state that social and emotional learning has the potential to help mitigate the interrelated legacies of racial and class oppression in the US and globally. Um, but you also write that Currently, that potential is underrealized. So I thought maybe we could just start there and talk a little bit about how you've come to understand SEL through your career of researching this topic um, and this important potential that it has. Thanks. Um, so um, it's important to, I guess, state up front that um, you know I've, I'm a longtime uh, colleague of Roger Weisberg, who is uh, the founder of Castle, or one of the founders of Castle, and he and I worked uh, when I was at UIC in the 90s on a large-scale randomized control trial, uh, developing an uh, an Afrocentric risk prevention program for middle schoolers. And so, um, and since then, we have been colleagues. I've been a friend of Castle and participated in a number of its work groups and the like. Um, my own basic research, uh, basic and applied research, has really focused, though, on um, issues of cultural integrity and uh, social political development of young people, especially uh, African American youth. And so, it's with a particular, and those um, 
interests really focus on the and promote the communal aspects of human development. And so when we uh, wrote this piece, I think part of what we were trying to um, offer up was a kind of a loving critique of what we understood the, pro the primary emphasis of, of SEL to be as it was uh, developing. And then uh, positioning ourselves to engage in a conversation that would expand the field to include others like ourselves who have been working uh, around issues of, of social and emotional development of young people, especially young people of color. Uh, and we viewed ourselves as um, uh, grounded in SEL, but not fully integrated into the larger conversation. And so this initial piece uh, was a way of beginning to offer a loving critique and to open up a conversation to, again, to uh, bring uh, some of our thinking more fully into the field and integrate that into frameworks, resources, and the like. In you know, in doing in doing that work, it, I mean, it was evident that you know, consistent with our own interest in kind of collective well-being, et cetera, that SEL itself is rooted in in uh, social justice, and so uh, really beginning to illuminate or art better articulate how SEL, its frame and the way it was sketched out and the resources that it had generated and the interest that it had generated could really be made relevant to issues of collective well-being uh, for all young people. Can you say a little bit about um, how you've understood the forms of SEL that you describe in that paper? Sure, well, you know, part of the work uh, that is required uh, uh, for the kind of for the kind of thing that we wanted to engage in was really um, offering up additional conceptual precision, right? Becoming um, clearer about the ways in which, for example, the competency buckets really could be made relevant to the developmental imperatives and the lived experiences of young people who uh, we uh, work with and for, and also to begin to think about how we could bring to bear the kind of methodological rigor that um, SEL had been had been utilizing over time, evidence-based best practices, et cetera, because our understanding was that um, the issues and concerns that we were uh, researching did not have, and it does not have that kind of robust evidence base, and, and that's critical. Um, so we began thinking about ways to organize the literature to reflect the kinds of uh, concerns that uh, we shared. We were working at the time on um, civic development and found that to be a useful frame for beginning to understand social and emotional learning as a civic uh, socialization process, really, because, because by definition, it, uh, SEL was about the ways in which people in, in across context interacted with one another. And so for us, that was really, you know, civic development. And um, then because we were immersed in that literature and others, simply brought to bear some of the thinking of other, uh, of other colleagues like uh, Joe Kahn and, and, uh, um, and James Banks, who had been working on notions of citizenship and civic education. And they, they had offered up these different types of, of uh, uh, civic development to include personally responsible, participatory, and what they call justice-oriented um, uh, citizenship. And so we utilize that frame then to begin to organize SEL literature, and it provided us an opportunity to bring in uh, concepts that were more consistent with justice-oriented or what we have come to talk about as transformative social and emotional learning. Um, so we anchored the work, it importantly anchored the work in the existing CASEL framework. And that's what I meant earlier by the fact that it, you know, the existing SEL framework provided a rough sketch that we then used as a kind of a palette to kind of paint a deeper picture of the, or a more nuanced picture of what we deem to be relevant for um, young people of color and other young people as well, as maybe we'll talk a little later. 
Yeah, and I think that um, looking at these different forms can be really helpful for um, educators and for all of us to really think about what are the social and emotional competencies that I need to be responsible for myself, to be a good neighbor, to be a good um, classmate, and be a good um, sort of community member. Um, and then there's maybe some more advanced, um, more more complex skill development to really be engaging actively in my school community and with my classmates. And then yet another form where our sensitivities to ourselves, how we fit in the community, how we fit in the, the school community or our broader global community, how we fit into that and what is our sort of sense of um, what's the, the the way in which the world works and, and our responsibility, frankly, to uh, pay attention to places of inequities. And so I think when we talk about transformative SEL or justice-oriented SEL, we're really talking about not just you know, awareness of others and their feelings, but really awareness of um, how this system that we all live in works, who it works for, and what it will take for it to be a equitable environment for all. Um, and I think it's important to talk more about this transformative SEL. Uh, the districts that Castle's partner that Castle partners with, which we'll talk about more later, um, have really taken this approach to their SEL work. And you can see a kind of working definition up here. Um, but I think it'd be great if you could talk a little bit more, Rob, about kind of what are those skills and competencies that are that when we talk about transformative SEL um, that we mean. Sure. I, that, so I appreciated your your earlier comments because that you know we in in you know in this work in making SEO more robust for issues of equity, it does move us towards um, uh, embracing both intrapersonal, interpersonal, and institutional kind of competencies and seeing how from a social his social historical as well as contemporary context. You know, issues of race, class, culture, gender, et cetera, are actually um, operating both in people's minds, in people's interactions with one another, but also institutionally. And so, transformative SEL is really intended to to um, appreciate that reality because um, while it is um, um, a good thing to appreciate people for who they are, to ignore the fact that they are raced, classed, et cetera. I know uh, a colorblind or power blind approach ignores the humanity of the people that you're interacting with, right? right. And so transformative SEL simply brings to bear or makes explicit the fact that this is an important, is an important feature of how we interact with, with each other, but also how our institutions function. And so the degree to which uh, people construct institutions, they should be attentive to the context that we're setting for our interactions with one another. Great. Um, and Emily, if you can bring us to the next slide um, where you, you've sort of given some examples within the Castle 5 competency framework that so many are familiar with, what are some of the specific competencies? And, uh, and in fact, We've been working at Castle with um, Rob and with our districts and experts to really uh, update our definition of, of SEL to include and be more explicit about these really important elements. Um, and on the next slide, um, we have a working draft of how we are looking at those five um, that will hopefully help educators and um, policymakers and those who create programs and those who are creating assessments and and writing standards and guidelines really be more explicit about some of these important elements to self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So you can, for those of you that are familiar with CASEL's framework, you can see that in this updated language um, that there are, there's more uh, attention and explicit mention of things like examining beliefs and biases under self-awareness, 
or um, thinking about our integration of personal and social identity. Um, also, if you look at social awareness, you can see, for example, recognizing situational demands and social interdependence. So you'll notice on here that we uh, that we're working to create definitions of these areas so that it's more clear. Um, and I think this is a an opportunity to Rob to talk about. Um, where we've seen a limited view of what social and emotional learning is um, and how it may have played out in a way that is detrimental to students if they're not really understanding um, the full way in which we at CASEL understand SEL. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the dangers of a limited view or what, we, what we've seen? Sure, and a couple of points to, um, you know, we, um, to, to add to your earlier comment about this um, uh, work on definitions, one thing that I think is imp just important to say before getting to your other um, uh, question is that the bullet points are simply exemplars. They are not, they are not exhaustive of the types of uh, characteristics, qualities, features that are reflected in self-awareness, are reflected in social awareness, et cetera. And so um, it, in some ways it's an invitation for, these are just, um, again, examples that people can in their own work uh, further flesh out, et cetera. We try to offer relatively robust definitions and then some bullet points to reflect some of the developmental and equity facing um, con considerations that we've been talking about. And so, you know, to your other point about um, the challenges associated with uh, personally responsible and participatory um, approaches, I think, you know, one of the things, I mean, I mentioned earlier this issue of, of um, um, colorblind and powerblind. I think in the, in the absence of uh, conscious awareness that race and class and gender operate in our interactions, we stand the possibility of being reproductive of the inequities that we are experiencing in our schools, in our communities, in our healthcare systems, et cetera, et cetera. And so only through explicit reckoning with uh, the inequities can we then move to um, toward a more equitable learning environment both for the young people, but also for the adults as well. Uh, because these things, you know, we had up the bullet points earlier and the, and the uh, core competencies, you need to realize that those are developmental in nature, meaning that uh, from uh, cradle through career, people are developing identity of various sorts, um, sense of belonging of various sorts, agency of various sorts. And so to assume that these things are simply limited to students, I think under, uh, undermines the potential for, of, of SEL and similar approaches to actually create the kind of um, uh, schools as institutions, but other learning environments that we know are critically important, um, creating the kinds of spaces where we can look at optimal human development across race, class, and culture. Yes, and I think um, while ha being more explicit about these things is, is so important, um, especially because when, um, when, you, when we've seen schools or districts who have implemented SEL as part of, for example, a behavior management strategy or to sort of coerce kids to comply with a certain set of rules or norms or um, to be more about um, self-management over you know these other areas which unfortunately happens and in the name of SEL which which shows a, a misunderstanding even of the complexity of all of the competencies working together and the importance of reflection and understanding of oneself and others not just of our students um, but as you pointed out, also the adults. Um, and in fact, I think it would be great to just talk for a minute about what kind of adult SEL and learning environment is essential to foster transformative SEL competence in young people. 
Well, well as you know, uh, Melissa, we um, are really committed to kind of surfacing evidence about, you know, uh, about programs, practices, and approaches. Um, and in some of the work we've done, you know, there's some key features with, uh, that, that one might look for. And one, uh, one of those features is power sharing, meaning um, really positioning young people as experts of their own lived experience and as uh, co-constructors and co-creators of and, and critical consumers of, of information and, and knowledge, right? That, that they are, uh, they have the capacity, the interest and the talent to actually fully engage in the learning process, which then leads to them being lifelong learners and having a sense of agency and belonging in, the, in a school environment a classroom, a school, a community that they have helped to co-construct. They have a different sense of engagement and belonging. So, the, and the other piece that I think is critical, um, like a key cross-cutting feature, is um, anchoring the work on young people's lived experience, right? Making it, making the educational experience relevant to what it is they are experiencing, the both the assets and the challenges that exist in their communities, and helping them to figure out how academic content then helps them address those concerns and build the world that they and we uh, want to see. And so this, that anchoring and then scaffolding as young people get older, I think is, is, is a critical feature. And that's why you can start with um, you know, attention to these competencies when young people are very young, because fairness is a fundamental consideration in uh, transformative SEL and as, and, and as young people uh, get older as as children begin to age, um, they 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 begin to understand fairness in different contexts. Issues of identity begin to intersect with that kind of basic understanding of how to treat other people, and then we as as adults help them to scaffold that knowledge, and then be, have them become fairer, more humane, more just, et cetera. Right, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, we got so many great questions from participants as they registered, um, many of whom are really wanting to know how do we create environments and provide um, experiences for our youngest learners um, that can help with this sort of transformative SEL and thinking about race and racism. Um, and I, what you just mentioned about sort of some of these early concepts that underpin this, I think is really important. Um, we are gonna get into those questions in much more detail about the actual how in the, in the, the webinars that will follow this one um, on the actual implementation. But I wonder if you could just share even a couple of um, kind of high level um, either programs or strategies that, that we've seen in districts that, um, that are focused on transformative SEL, social justice, or creating that sort of shared power that you talked about. Yeah, so um, in our program guide, for example, we point to facing the history in ourselves. Um, we uh, also point to project-based learning as a way to um, cultivate these, these types of skills. Uh, youth participatory action research of various forms is also a way to have a, um, a student-led or student-informed kind of educational experience that you know, speaks to those key features that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, some of our colleagues at University of Michigan, for example, are starting that work with uh, pre-K students, so it is possible to begin this work very early and then scaffold um, um, over time. Um, our good colleague, Clark McNown, uh, and I were just on a call, and he was talking about um, pr uh, prejudice reduction programs that utilize cooperative learning opportunities and other kinds of uh, group-focused activities um, to help young people develop relationships across difference. So all of these kind of educational um, uh, or SEL approaches and practices, I think um, merit further attention and can be used in, in, in uh, classrooms across the country. Yeah, and I think um, 
everything that you're saying really resonates um, to be thinking about this, not just as something to ask high school students to critically examine structures, but really to be laying that foundation of, you know, the forms of SEL that you describe are all important. But when we talk about personally responsible, we want kids to be personally responsible. We want kids to um, be a good neighbor and a good classmate, and we want them to engage. But this idea of like, how do you question the systems in place and how you fit into them and where there are, where there is um, inequity, uh, there are foundational pieces that you might be able to lay in early ages and experiences with cooperative learning, with project-based learning, um, to lay that important groundwork. Um, and I think another thing that you said that is just so important, and again, we'll be talking about this more in a future webinar is, the adults that work with young people, uh, that's a, for some of the teachers, maybe kind of a new way of thinking about shared um, co-constructed learning experiences where um, there, it really requires a high level of social, emotional, and cultural competence to create yes. that learning environment. Um, so we can't really underestimate the importance of the adults in creating this environment that promotes SEL for students. And I would also add, which again, we'll talk more about, is um, working closely with families and community yes. partners as part of how we think about um, the education of our young people, especially as we strive to learn about their lived experience. Um, we cannot ignore the important role of family in that and the community partners who often live you know, and work in those communities, whereas the teacher themselves may not. Um, so these are really important connections as we think about that real systems approach to SEL, not simply a programmatic approach to SEL, which I know um, we'll talk a little bit more about. Yes, and the other thing that I would introduce right here is, is uh, which I think is important for um, people participating in this uh, webinar to appreciate is that is, um, for example, our colleagues. Um, um, uh, John Powell and colleagues have introduced this notion of targeted universalism, which I think is important because often when we have conversations about equity, we're assuming race, we're assuming, you know, and, and, and of course that's a, that's a nagging, uh, vexing problem that we have, but there are ways to promote this more um, uh, robust and, and complex way of engaging that, in identity development and sense of agency and belonging that is also appropriate for well-resourced uh, uh, students or white students in particular, um, because we live in an, in an environment where oftentimes um, students from those backgrounds are not introduced to these more complex social issues in a timely right. fashion and they struggle with it. Right, um, and there've been a lot of questions from participants about how to help uh, students, especially in predominantly white schools with white staff, um, to really examine um, these critical issues, which they may have thought historically didn't feel as relevant and recognizing it is extremely relevant for all of us um, to be looking at those things. Um, so I think that's a great additional point. So maybe we can talk a little bit about our partner districts and how they're approaching this work um, so that we can kind of lead into what we're going to be talking about for the next five weeks. Um, Castle has been partnering with districts to really understand and support a systemic approach to SEL for um, since its inception t over 25 years ago. Um, and significantly in 2011, uh, CASEL launched an initiative called the Collaborating Districts Initiative or the CDI, where our goal was to partner with districts so that we could really understand what would a systems approach to SEL look like? What does that even mean? And is that something that is feasible to do, especially in large urban districts where you have um, so much turnover and you have um, you know, budget cuts and lots of things happening um, and just the sheer size? And, and if you could do that, what kinds of outcomes would you get for students? So that work was started in 2011 with eight districts. 
um, it has since evolved to a, a robust learning community um, that now has 20 districts that are working together to, again, better understand how to take a systems approach to SEL. And one thing that's been really interesting, especially over the last um, five to six years, is that this priority and understanding that their SEL work is a critical part of their equity work um, has really uh, helped Castle to sharpen our own focus on that issue. Um, and in fact, four years ago, we began convening not just the leads who were over SEL, but also those over the equity work within these districts in what we've called an equity work group. Um, and together, these convenings have helped us to learn from the districts how they're thinking about this work and facilitate cross-sharing of information. Um, in the beginning, we saw some districts were way out ahead um, really in thinking about equity and the role of SEL in achieving equity, and some were just beginning to understand that. I would say today there is unanimous agreement that, that SEL is a critical lever towards their equity work. And in fact, in recent years, the districts that have joined that community um, have very much joined it for that express purpose, that they that they are focused on equity as part of their strategic plan and that they see that social and emotional learning is a critical element to achieving that equity mission. Um, so maybe, Rob, you could talk a little bit about, as one of the leaders in the equity work group, um, about the work that's happening in that group and how you're um, working with experts, working with the districts, and, and studying this work. Sure. Um... So uh, as part of uh, the equity uh, work group engagement, uh, we've begun what we call collaborative inquiry with districts and with external partners to include um, the National Equity Project, the Chicago Consortium uh, for um, School Research to really interrogate some of the working assumptions that we have about um, transformative approaches to, to SEL. Um, districts like Guilford County, uh, North Carolina, where we've really um, been very much impressed with the ways in which they have um, articulated a vision for uh, how their young people, um, how they, you know, the kind of educational experiences they want for the young people. And we are leaning in trying to uh, support that work. Um, Minneapolis uh, Public Schools is another place where we've worked very hard and worked very collaboratively to, um, to uh, advance the notions of transformative SEL, um, all with an idea of really, you know, thinking about both adult SEL, but also academic, uh, social, emotional integration. Yes, and you've also uh, just hit on one sort of teaser I'll give the group for next week. We will be hearing directly from Minneapolis public schools educators about their longstanding commitment to educational equity and to SEL as a key piece of that, how they've been thinking about and communicating about that, um, which I think will be a very timely discussion. Um, and as we think about the work with these districts, the equity and SEL work has been critical to understanding their systemic implementation. Um, and it's been critical for us at CASEL to really think about how does equity show up in the work um, kind of in a broad way, and also how does it show up, like what are the key elements to that? Um, so Emily, if you could actually pull up the next slide. Some folks on this uh, may be familiar with CASEL's sort of systemic model for thinking about social and emotional learning at the district level. Um, and I sometimes read this from actually from right to left, where we look at, you know, these are the outcomes that we know um, from decades of research that social and emotional learning can lead to. Everything from better attitudes about self and others, better climate, um, academic success, uh, as well as college and career and life success. So we know that there's really important outcomes that we're striving for. And this, this uh, wheel in the middle really describes kind of the framework that, that is familiar to many about how we think about those competencies and how those competencies can be promoted in a systemic way in a school. So not just in the classroom, but the school itself, 
and with families and community partners. So that's kind of how we think about what's happening at the school. And then this left side really talks more about what does it mean? Um, how do you do that? And whether we are talking at the state level, the district level, the school level, um, we have focused on these four areas of implementation that are really important to take to achieve that systemic approach. So what are some of the foundational pieces that have to be in place um, in order to do this work systemically? Um, what are, what's the key important work that has to be um, prioritized for adults so that they can build their own social, emotional, and cultural competence? Um, and then of course, how do we promote SEL for our students? And then lastly, um, how do we know if what we're doing is working and continuously improve the implementation? Uh, so really thinking through this systemic model, the question is sort of like, where does equity show up in this? And, and actually, equity shows up throughout this. Um, we have documented in CASEL's District Resource Center, what does it mean to look at this with an equity lens at every level? So you'll see information about what does it mean to create a shared vision? Whose vision is that? Who's at the table for that, for example? Um, so all of that is on Castle's District Resource Center. Um, but one thing that we've learned from our equity work group and working closely with them is there are actually five key actions that we see across the community of things that our districts who are prioritizing SEL in service of equity are, are doing. Um, so if we can talk a little bit about, um, so those four buckets are the main buckets, but the five levers that we see um, that districts are thinking about in this work, the first one that falls into this first bucket of build foundational support and plan is that as part of their communication strategy, they are very clear about how they define SEL and they use a transformative um, SEL approach and how they're communicating about that as a lever for equity. The communication is critically important. They are very sensitive to the possibility that if not communicated well or explicitly that um, it may be misinterpreted as, for example, we talked earlier about a behavior intervention or some way to just you know, control students or, you know, only working with a handful of students. So really explicitly positioning um, what we mean by SEL and how it fits into our equity mission is something that we've seen across the board. And next week, actually, we'll be hearing from Minneapolis Public Schools about that. The second thing that we've seen across the board is there's been a significant priority on the adults and that the adults themselves have to engage in this work. Last week in our webinar um, that we had on owning your power to raise kids who challenge racism, um, Dr. Debbie Rivas Drake and um, Ladine Barthless both talked about before we help our students, we have to focus on ourselves. Before we help our children as parents, we have to focus on ourselves. Uh, the same is true here. So a lot of our districts are engaging in um, anti-bias work, um, giving opportunities for community building and social emotional learning as part of um, the adult's own experience so that they are better prepared for this. The third one has to do with what it is that we are focusing on when we're promoting a comprehensive view of SEL, and in particular, an emphasis on students' cultural assets, youth voice and agency. Um, everyone agrees that the full gamut of social and emotional competencies are critically important, um, but these pieces in particular are emphasized and sort of in, there's an intentionality to make sure that this is a, a um, front and center of their SEL work. The fourth one, which we alluded to earlier, has to do with um, really partnering authentically with families and communities to make sure that we are um, working together and that we have a culturally responsive approach to SEL. Um, and then lastly, when we think about continuous improvement and data, um, our districts are looking very carefully at the data that they're collecting, how they're collecting it, how they're displaying it, and how that data may actually be surfacing some inequities. So it's a really careful examination of the data so that we are um, able to use that process of continuous improvement, not only to improve our implementation, but also to critically examine what are the policies and practices that we have in place that may be producing inequities and how do we address those. 
Um, so these are five of the kind of big strategies that districts are thinking about when they think about um, promoting social emotional learning in a systemic approach. And I'm sure everyone here is thinking like, well, that's great, but how do you do that? And that's really where I think the important work um, is being done. And so we are excited about this webinar to just launch the next five webinars, which will each one take each of these and look at what they mean at um, at within the districts and within the states and within schools and even within ourselves. Um, and in fact, the next five webinars, we, we'll bring back um, Bladine Bartholis, who was with us last week, who's going to be working to um, to examine these five in a deeper way. So I'd like to invite Bladine to to join us and to share a little bit about what's planned for the next five webinars as we unpack these. Hi, Thank Bladine. you, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Rob. Um, I'd like to first thank both of you um, for really taking the time to walk us through the research base um, and really making a clear case as to why shifting our perspective on SEL is critical um, and, and why using it as a lever is for equity is critical to the work. Um, it's, it's important to recognize that even a construct as well-intentioned as social emotional learning can serve to support injustice if it's not implemented with a lens of equity. So you really laid out, you know, research-wise, practical-wise, just different ways that we should be looking at the work and why even if we engage in the SEL work, it requires us to do so with a lens of equity. Um, one of the some of the key points that I heard that I really want to emulate or lift up for, for folks, um, and I'm sure I've taken tons of notes and I actually work with Castle, so um, the learning <laughs> never ends. <laughs> um, but some points that really came up um, and elevated for me was um, the notion of to engage in this work from a colorblind or powerblind lens is to ignore someone's humanity. Um, and only serves to perpetuate the inequities that we talk about um, dismantling. Um, another point that came up when we talk about the developmental process of social emotional learning, um, the, the idea that this is a cradle through career process and that people are developing their identity and agency um, throughout their lifespan. And so this idea that social emotional learning is just for, for children or just for students, um, is definitely something that we should lay to rest um, and recognize that the work is there for everyone. If you are still breathing, there is still work to be done. Um, another piece here is just the, the feature, one of the features or strategies that was really powerful to hear um, was the idea of power sharing and allowing students to become co-constructors of their learning opportunity, um, as opposed to just um, recipients of what we've decided they need to know. Um, I could go on and on, um, and I'm sure you could as well if we had another three hours, but we will definitely end on time. Um, we wanna let you all know that what's coming up next, Melissa has laid out very nicely just what the five explicit key points we are learning from districts who are engaging in this work. And what we wanna do is take one week, one seminar, her explicit learning and really unpack that um, and talk about um, what is it that we're hearing from leaders who are on the ground doing this work. We want you to hear about their successes. We want you to hear about their challenges and what they're discovering. But we also want, to, want you to hear about the ongoing struggle that they're encountering as they're pushing into this work. Um, through their stories, our hope is that you will find where your own personal entry point is and that you will identify what are the most practical strategies that make sense for you um, to engage in this work. You know, school is out for you already, one school return, even to engage in this work in your home as we're thinking about how do we really dismantle racism as a construct in our, in our, in our society. So, we know that you probably send, we, we've had tons of questions come in um, for this webinar. Um, it's very likely to, that we didn't have an opportunity to address all of them. We want you to know that we appreciate the questions. Please keep sending them in. Um, we would like to also let you know that what we're hoping to do is to unpack more of those questions 
throughout the series. So send those in, we'll, we'll continue to bucket them, address them as best as we can, but we're pretty confident that over the next five weeks that we will be able to answer um, several of them, if not most of them. Um, I want, I'd like to really just, just speak to you as a, a viewer and observer, a, a participant, um, you've been on this journey with us. Some of you, this is your first webinar. For others, you've been with us since we started the Castle Cares Initiative. And we wanna say thank you to you. Um, whether you're a classroom teacher, a parent, an administrator, a student, a community organizer, or anyone in between, this really is our call to action. It really, really is. Feelings, emotions, they'll subside. You know, in about a month or two, we'll find something else to begin to work on. Life will continue to take its course. The news span will move to a different story. But if we are committed to being the change that we want to see in this world, um, we ask that you partner with us during these series. Um, let's develop a community of learning where we're better positioned to do the technical and the adaptive work that's required to really push into this work and to really dismantle what has been constructed against our students and against our society um, in our educational system. Um, so your next step is to register. Um, we have registration coming up for the next series, for the next session. We ask that you register and that you find a colleague, a partner, a friend, someone to register as well. We really want to make sure that you have the strategies, the steps, the tools to do the work that you're excited about doing at this point.